In this video, we'll look at a classic radio, the Zenith H500 Super Transoceanic Portable. I'll briefly cover the history of this radio and the Transoceanic series. We'll look at the radio's features, go over the front panel controls, and take a look inside. I'll discuss the restoration of this particular radio and give a demonstration of it operating. Finally, I'll provide a few references to where you can learn more about the H500 and other Zenith Transoceanic radios. Transoceanic was the name given to a series of portable radios produced from 1942 to 1981 by Zenith Radio. They were known for their high quality of construction and performance as shortwave receivers. Zenith's founder, Commander Eugene F. MacDonald, was a yachtsman and outdoorsman and wanted a portable radio that could receive broadcast and shortwave stations as well as marine weather stations. He challenged his company's engineers to develop such a radio and personally tested a number of prototypes until they met his standards. The first model was the 7G605 Transocean Clipper, introduced in 1942 at a price of $75. It was followed after the Second World War by the 8G005Y and was produced from 1946 to 1949. The G500, introduced in 1949, used miniature vacuum tubes. The focus of this video, the H500 Super Transoceanic, was introduced in May 1951 at an initial price of $99.95. Compared to the G500, it had a redesigned front face and incorporated many frequency coverage and electronic changes ordered by McDonald. There was a military version of the H500 known as the R520-URR, which was manufactured for the U.S. government and widely used in the Korean War. In 1954, the H500 was replaced by the 600 series, which introduced a slide rule type dial. This series was in production until 1962. In November 1957, Zenith introduced the first fully transistorized transoceanic, the Royal 1000. This was followed by other models, including the 1000D, 3000, and 7000. The last model of the series was the R7000, introduced in 1979 and produced until 1981. The H500 was initially offered in 1951 at $99.95, later increasing to $124.25. This is roughly equivalent to $1,100 today. Production figures from Zenith Corporation indicate that almost 250,000 H500 units were manufactured over the four years that it was offered. Total sales of transoceanic models was over 1 million by 1965. The Zenith H500 Super Transoceanic is a portable radio in the sense that it can be operated by batteries and carried by a handle. A lid protects the front panel controls and is raised during operation. It can be powered from an internal battery or the 110 volt AC or DC power line. There was an optional adapter for 220 volt power. The manual states that if used an average of three to four hours per day or 30 hours per week, the internal battery should give approximately 150 hours of service. The battery was not rechargeable. The antenna can be the internal wave magnet, which can be used internally or mounted externally using suction cups to a window in a train, plane, car, or building. There's also a large telescoping wave rod antenna. It also supports external antenna and ground connections using terminals on the rear panel of the chassis. The H500 provides general coverage from 2 to 8 megahertz over two bands, and selected portions of four short wave bands. By only covering a limited portion of the short wave bands, tuning was made much easier. The bands covered are band one, the short wave AM broadcast band from 540 to 1600 kilohertz. Band two, short wave weather band from four to eight megahertz. Band three, short wave weather band from two to four megahertz. Band four, the 16 meter short wave band from 17.5 to 18.1 megahertz. Band 5, the 19 meter short wave band from 14.9 to 15.5 megahertz. 
Band 6, the 25 meter shortwave band from 11.6 to 12 megahertz. And band 7, the 31 meter shortwave band from 9.4 to 9.8 megahertz. The weather bands were particularly important at the time to yachtsmen, sportsmen, and others operating boats in the Great Lakes, Pacific Coast, Atlantic Coast, Gulf of Mexico, and Caribbean Sea for maritime weather reports. Note that marine weather is no longer broadcast on these bands. There is, however, shortwave broadcast and amateur radio activity on these bands. A split-second log scale from 0 to 60 is provided for recording band positions in a log book. Tone can be controlled by the four-button radio organ control, which offers 16 total tonal accommodations. The four buttons are marked treble, voice, alto, and bass. It has a built-in speaker and on the back a quarter-inch headphone jack. The radio is a pretty standard 5-tube superhet design using a 455 kHz IF frequency. The tube lineup consists of a 1U4 RF amplifier, a 1L6 converter, 1U4 IF amplifier, 1U5 AVC second detector and first audio amplifier, and a 3V4 power amplifier. The 1L6 is one of the rarer vacuum tubes, mostly because it was not used in many commercial radios and not made in high volumes. Replacements are quite expensive. The more common 1R5 can be substituted, but will usually perform poorly on the short wave bands. A 1LA6 can also be used as a substitute, but as it is a loctal based tube, it will require building some kind of tube socket adapter. There are some circuits for and commercially made solid state replacements for the 1L6. The H500 used a selenium rectifier in the power supply. These are notorious for failing and giving off foul smelling and toxic smoke. It's generally recommended to replace it with a more modern solid state diode. Because modern diodes produce a smaller voltage drop, you'll need to add or change some resistors to compensate. Detailed instructions on how to do this can be found on the internet. The unit is completely self-contained and can be carried using the provided handle. The wooden case is covered in a leather-like paper that Zenith called Black Stag. Opening the latching front cover reveals the front panel controls. The left knob is the on-off and volume control. The right knob is tuning. At the left is the speaker grill, and on the right are the seven push-button band switches. At the bottom is the tone control with four independent controls, giving a total of 16 tone combinations. Each switch increases or decreases response for a different range of frequencies. The circular dial scale shows frequencies for each of the seven bands. The marine and weather bands and one amateur radio band are marked in red on the dial. At the top is the logging scale for recording tuning positions in a logbook. On the top lid is the wave magnet antenna. It can be unscrewed, connected via supplied cable, and attached via suction cups to the window of an automobile, ship, or train. This allowed it to be used in a location like a ship that would otherwise be shielded by metal. Another option is the large telescoping antenna, which can be extended as desired. Fully extended, it's over four feet long. The rear panel is hinged and opens by pulling on the hole in the center. At the back is access to the power plug and headphone jack. The battery compartment is below the chassis and the battery connects via this cable. 
When running on battery power, the power plug must be inserted into a connector on the chassis. There are screw terminals for an external antenna and ground. There's a socket for an external regulator not present on this unit that allowed the radio to run on a wider range of voltages, 105 to 122 volts, or a 220 volt adapter. The rear door has a clip for holding the manual and a place to store the wave magnet cable and suction cups. This unit has clips for storing a set of spare vacuum tubes. This seems to be a rather rare accessory that's not seen on most units. Removing the chassis, you can see that it's quite small in comparison to the case. The tubes are of the miniature type. The tuning switch head is quite complex and has some fragile wires and coils. The speaker is mounted on rubber grommets. Under the chassis you can see that it used point-to-point -point wiring. This radio was bought on eBay in 2004. It was complete and came with a working original 1L6 tube, the rare one mentioned earlier. As received, it was not working. I gave the unit a good cleaning. The black stag covering was given a coat of black shoe polish. I stripped and painted the brass latch gold. The brass inserts for the two knobs, known as knob brights, were corroded and I replaced them with modern replacement parts. It came with a reproduction of the service manual for the military model of the H500, and I also found a rider's service manual and Sam's photo fact on the internet. Electrically, it was recapped. All of the wax paper capacitors were replaced with new ones. Many of the original paper capacitors were of the Sprague Black Beauty or Bumblebee type. Despite being popular with some audiophiles, this type are notorious for becoming electrically leaky over time and affecting performance. The electrolytic filter caps were replaced by removing the insides of the original filter cap and restuffing it with the new, smaller replacement caps. I replaced the selenium rectifier with a solid state diode and dropping resistor as well as a Zener diode mounted on a terminal strip. I also added a fuse. Some of the power resistors on the filament circuit were also replaced. One of these power resistors was open and was the main cause of the radio not working. I also measured the values of all resistors and replaced any that were out of spec. The original antenna was bent and missing the end cap. I was able to find a replacement antenna on eBay. I performed a full alignment based on the service manual. This is a reasonably complex procedure due to the number of different bands. The original Zenith Z985 battery pack provided 9 and 90 volts and is no longer available. There are a few options to replace it. You can use multiple D and 9 volt batteries to get the required voltages. There are some commercial battery packs to do this on the market. There are also more sophisticated battery replacements that have circuitry to step up and regulate the voltage. I purchased a battery pack from a seller on eBay that takes 10 D cells. It's contained in a box the size of the original battery and has a connector to fit the radio. Let's take a look at the radio in operation. It's evening here in Ottawa, Canada, and I'll just be using the internal antenna in a room in the basement. We can pick up a few local AM broadcast stations. Jerry Francona gathering the troops yet again this year. Those Indians making that late season. Your season-long league at DraftKings, crowning millionaires all season. You could be next. The call to action is this. Go to DraftKings. On the 4 to 8 megahertz band, we can pick up a number of commercial shortwave broadcasts. Now this must have been just a short-term thing because Aaron was the older... Well, 
Transponder 23, frequency 1211. As you can see, but if your life is not an example to them, a lot of times you're going to just pull them right down with you. Yeah, that's what we'll say back in the day when I was... People you want to fix, husbands, wives. During the war against the Japanese aggression in China, we understand over 300,000 people were killed in the Sound quality is very good due to a reasonably large speaker and wooden case. Tuning is quite easy on the band spread bands. Unlike more sophisticated communication receivers, this radio has only basic controls, which also made it easy to use. For example, it has no BFO, so it cannot receive Morse code or single sideband signals. Where it really shone was as a portable radio that could stand up to rough handling and a wide range of temperature and humidity conditions. As mentioned, I obtained this reproduction of the service manual for the military version of the H500, the R520URR. It provides detailed information on operation and servicing. The definitive guide to the Transoceanics is the book The Zenith Transoceanic, The Royalty of Radios by John Bryant and Harold Cones. There's also a Yahoo group devoted to discussions on the Transoceanic radios. And you can find numerous websites and videos on the internet with historical and restoration information. The Zenith Transoceanic series were high-performance, portable shortwave radios that made use of the leading technology of the time. The H500 was the most popular model in the series. It's no surprise, then, that it's one of the most desirable radios among collectors. Despite that, these radios are widely available from sources like eBay at reasonable prices and with a little effort can usually be restored to their original condition. I hope you've enjoyed this video about a piece of vintage radio equipment. Please check out my other videos on vintage shortwave, amateur radio and test equipment.